Okay, I'll have your exams on Wednesday. Um, and I think there's the final saplings, our chapter eight saplings, and they're due whenever it is online. The chapter nine for the alkynes that we're going to do on Wednesday and Friday, I will release, but they won't be due. They'll just be practice. Um, and to be honest, I start next semester out with chapter, I think, at least nine. So that's usually my first assignment there. Okay, so there'll be a video and an online quiz for Wednesday and Friday. But today what I want to do is I want to finish up the alkene, the alkene reactions. So where did we leave off? We left off with epoxides and just making the epoxides. So we left off with the two methods. The first method being you can make a bromohydrin, treat the bromohydrin with base, which would deprotonate the OH group and make it an alkoxide. Normally, alkoxides we've done as bases that do E2s, but in this case, because the alkoxide is perfectly set up to react backside attack on this carbon, it will, and it'll kick the bromine off, and you will make this final epoxide. That's two steps. Um, not the best way to make, make it. The best way to make it would be to use a peroxy acid, which is going to be a stereospecific reaction, so that when you react the alkene with the peroxy acid, you end up with the epoxide. And this is stereospecific because, again, if I change the alkene stereochemistry from cis or trans, I get a different stereochemistry of the product. So this trans alkene gives the trans epoxide, the cis alkene gives the cis epoxide. So that was stereospecificity. And what I'm going to add on here, and there was a time when I used to have to do all of my drawings this way. Apparently, my computer's decided to be a black screen, so I just can't look down at it and draw. But this takes me back like when I first started doing this stupid stuff of recording. We really should put bold and dashed wedges in to show our stereochemistry. So there's no optical illusion of which group, which groups are cis and which groups are trans. So again, if the hydrogen and the alkyl group here are cis, they're going to end up cis in the epoxide. So basically, you have the alkene and the epoxide, or the peroxy acid is going to plop the oxygen right on top of it add to both carbons immediately, and that's going to preserve the stereochemistry. So that's our second stereospecific reaction. Remember, our first one was SN2, where if I went from R to S, I would then change the, I would then change the stereochemistry of the product. In that case, it was always inversion. In this case, it's always going to be that cis or trans is retained in the product. Okay, so that's where we were at. So what we want to do is, well, what can I do with an epoxide? There's actually two things I can do with epoxides. I can open them up. And by opening them up, what I mean is that I'm going to take that three-membered ring and I'm going to open it up so that the OH goes on one carbon and then a nucleophile adds to the other carbon. So it's going to kind of look like a bromonium ion. It's going to look like a mercurium ion, where when the nucleophile attacks, the bromine or the mercury slid over and was bonded to the other carbon, and then the nucleophile attacked the first carbon. But the difference here is epoxides are stable molecules. 
I can make an epoxide and I can put it in the bottle. And there's actually, I've seen some different natural products out there where they have a whole bunch of different epoxides, including one I saw that had like three of the three membered rings in a row. It was made by some sea, sea urchin type thing out in Hawaii, which if that turned out to be a cancer, a drug, a molecule that would actually, you know, cure cancer or stop cancer, too bad for the sea urchin because then they're going to grab it, blend it up, and get that compound out. Then hopefully we can make it so that we don't have to kill all the sea urchins to kill cancer. But this is how natural products work. So surprisingly, it doesn't look like that's stable, but it is, and it can be made. So what happens, there's two ways to open this up. The first is acid catalyzed, and that's actually a misnomer because it's not really a catalyst. It's just acid is used to open up the epoxide. So here's what happens. Let's say I take my epoxide oxygen. I add acid to it. First step is always going to be protonate the oxygen. So I take my, my bond or my arrow here, and remember my arrow is always going towards the positive charge, and now I've protonated my oxygen to make a plus charge. Now that's the equivalent of adding a positive species to a double bond. Right? If I erase that OH plus and put a Br plus there, we've already been through that. So the oxygen isn't really happy with the positive charge. So what it does is it decides, well, it decides that, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply form a partial bond here to these two carbons, and it's going to help me by taking the positive charge, because carbon would be much happier with positive charge than oxygen would be. And so what have I made? I've just now made the equivalent of a bromonium ion or a mercury ion. Now, the first of acid catalyzed ring opening is to add H plus and H2O. So my H2O comes in and adds to the carbon. My question is, which carbon does the water add to? Now, in this case, I haven't really given you a choice, but let's put two R groups here. Let's just, for the sake of argument, put one R group there and put an H there. So which carbon is the water going to add to? The one on the left, the one on the right? I hear left. I hear it's soft or right. How many people say that the nucleophile is going to add to the left? How many people say it will add to the right? And the rest of you? <laughs> don't know, don't remember. Well, let's see. I'm having a deja vu of another time that we had a Monday, like right when we came back or right before we left from Thanksgiving, which wasn't that long ago, right? Because it was just last week we came back. It seems longer. So the nucleophile is going to add to the carbon with the most delta positive charge because water is a neutral nucleophile. And how does it react? Like it reacts SN1 like. So in this case, the water is going to add to the carbon that is most substituted because that's the carbon with the greatest delta positive charge. So in this case, that's going to be the greatest delta positive charge. And so that means over here, then once that nucleophile adds here, this pair of electrons goes to the oxygen. We break that bond. 
So over here, we've got our OH that slid over. And then, well, here we've got an R group. Here we've got an R group. And here we have our oxonium ion. <coughs> So I'll try and show it with some semblance of trans addition. So the water added underneath, the OH slid over. I guess I should finish that out with an R here and an H there. And then, of course, what happens next? Next, my pair of electrons again moves towards the oxygen. I end up losing H plus. I now end up with an OH down here. I end up with an OH up there. And so I end up with this final product where now I've added, I basically have added two OHs across the double bond. So this is called a vicinal diol. The diol term means it's a dialcohol. The vicinal term, vicinal just means that those two groups are adjacent to each other. They're on adjacent or next to each other carbons. So this is how we form, this one way to form a vicinal diol. Okay. So, if you're thinking about this, where did the epoxide come from? The epoxide came by taking a double bond and adding a peroxy acid to it. So in essence, what I've done is by making the epoxide and reacting it with H plus and H2O, doing acid, and in this case it is catalyzed, ring opening. I've added two OHs across the double bond, trans. I just haven't done it in one step. I did it in two <coughs> steps. Okay, does that kind of make sense? <coughs> So that's where epoxides come into play. Epoxides are going to actually give me the ability to add two things across the double bond, only not in one step, in two. And in this case, this is the only way that I can add two OHs trans across the double bond. I have lots of ways to add it cis, to add the two OHs cis, but this is the only trans addition. Does that kind of make sense? I guess I'll say yes for you. We'll come back. So there are other ways to add two groups across the double bond, but they are not electrophilic addition. In other words, the two groups add at the same time, and there's no plus charge. There's no positively charged species. So these are kind of non-electrophilic additions. And some of them are pretty straightforward. And most of these don't have a mechanism. I'm going to kind of show you a picture of the mechanism. It's not something that you'd have to draw, although we're already past drawing, right? Because the, fi the final exam is multiple choice. But I can still ask you mechanisms questions. But you're not responsible for these mechanisms. I'm just going to show them so if you go, oh, how do two hydrogens add? Maybe you'll remember the picture of the two hydrogens adding six. And that's what they do. So the first one is called hydrogenation. So hydrogenation is a reduction reaction. If we go back to lab, right, we did a reduction of a C double bond O with yeast. That was a reduction, that was actually a hydrogenation reaction in a, in a way. So in organic chemistry, it's difficult to keep track of electrons. It's difficult to try and put 
oxidation numbers on carbons, it's not difficult, it's just tedious. So we usually don't do that. We say if you add hydrogens, it's reduction. If you add oxygens, it's oxidation and vice versa. Lose hydrogens, oxidation, gain, or lose oxygens, it's reduction. So in this case, I am reducing the double bond to an alkane by adding two hydrogens across the double bond. And the catalyst that I use for this is either platinum or palladium metal. They're two expensive but unreactive metals. So I'm adding two hydrogens across the double bond. Can this reaction be regioselective? No, because it's a symmetrical reagent, so the reaction cannot be regioselective. Could it be stereoselective? It could because the two hydrogens are added six. So if I generate how many chiral carbons? Two. two. If I generate two chiral carbons in my product, because this reaction added 100% cis, it will be stereoselective. If I don't generate two chiral carbons, it's not. But still the hydrogens add 100% cis. So hydrogenation, the reason that the two hydrogens add cis is because the way that the mechanism is pictured, and I don't think it's the mechanism has been completely and totally worked out. It's one of these things we know we know what the products are, and we kind of have control over how it works. But I don't think anybody's completely verified all the mechanistic steps. What happens is hydrogen gas adsorbs onto the surface of the metal. Right. And absorb means it adds to the surface. Absorb means that it would go into the interior of the material. Right? Paper towel absorbs with a B. What we do actually in thin layer chromatography is all on the surface, so that's adsorb. So it adsorbs onto the surface of the metal. And then what happens is then the alkenes, P orbitals, will come down. There's my dot. They will come down here, and you'll add the hydrogen directly onto the double bond. So if I come over here, I can imagine a transition state that looks like that. And then maybe if I go up here, I can kind of think about maybe the arrows moving like that to form the two CH bonds, but break the hydrogen-hydrogen and the double bond. So that kind of a movement would give me this kind of a transition state. And what kind of transition state is that? It's a square. And what about square transition states? Six. So triangles add trans and squares add six. And where else have we seen a square? B, H3, H2O2. BH3, H2O2 is where we saw our last square transition state. Okay. Same thing happens here. So this is why the hydrogens add cis. So we get cis hydrogenation. So the cis hydrogenation is how we can convert double bonds into single bonds. And it's kind of important. I guess the best example I can give, the most practical example of this is that if we have a carboxylic acid with a really long chain, 
sometimes chains, sometimes those long chains are like 16, 18, 20 carbons long, and those are called fatty acids, right, from biochemistry. And your fatty acids can either be saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. That's from like food, right? And I forget which one is bad. I think the saturated ones are bad. They'll kill you eventually, allegedly. Um, they're, they're not good. The double bonds are unsaturated, which are a little better, I guess. I can tell you this much. Unsaturated fatty acids are solids. Or sorry, saturated fatty acids are solids. The double bond causes a kink in the in the chain and that they don't pack as well, so they become liquids. So if you have a liquid oil, it's an oil because it's a liquid. If you have a solid fat, it's because it's saturated, it's a solid, it's a fat. So sometimes what they do is they take the liquid vegetable oil and they hydrogenate it to make a solid fat like Crisco. And so what you end up with is sometimes the double bonds don't completely get hydrogenated, so you end up with partially hydrogenated things which are apparently really evil. And if you reverse the double bond and it's no longer cis and it becomes trans, oh my God, it's trans fatty acid. Right? There's cities that have outlawed those, I think, because they're, I guess, unnatural. So that's where all this terminology comes from. And you literally could take vegetable oil hydrogen gas and palladium, and you would bubble in the hydrogen, and it would turn from liquid to, sat, to solid. So that's how they do it. That's how they make the solid vegetable oils, which aren't solid. Can't be a solid in oil, but whatever. So there we go. OK, another non-electrophilic addition is, called, is carbene addition. Now, carbenes are carbons with two bonds and two unpaired electrons. They are really reactive because carbenes only have six electrons. They're sharing six. They own four. They're still neutral charged, but they only have six. Right? They're like a carbocation with no charge. So a carbene... What will happen is if you make a carbene, we'll have to talk about the different ways to do this, but if you make a carbene, this pair of electrons can move to form a carbon-carbon bond, and then this pair of electron, in terms of the double bond, will come out to form a bond to that carbon. So what we end up forming is we end up forming a cyclopropane ring. And so this is an easy way to make cyclopropanes. So cyclopropanes are a little bit more stable than you'd think. Um, you can't put them in bottles. There are plants and um, others that make these naturally. But that would be our reaction. So we're going through a trend, through a triangular transition state. And we're forming a triangular product. If the reaction, if the reaction is as I've shown it, where the carbene adds to the double bond in this, in these two steps simultaneously and the transition state would just be a dotted line triangle. What would I call this reaction? And I'm thinking this. Stereoselective. Regioselective. Or
stereospecific, which one would this reaction be? They give me an answer. Stereospecific. That's a good answer. So that's correct. It is stereospecific. This is kind of analogous of the epoxide, the peroxy acid plopping the oxygen into the double bond to form the triangle. It's the same thing here. So as long as this reaction occurs by these two steps simultaneously, this reaction is stereo specific meaning that if I have my bold and my dashed wedges here cis makes cis and if I change the cis to trans I change the stereochemistry of the product so this is another reaction that is stereospecific. So the only question is, how do you make carbenes? And these are just some of the ways, again, the method, the mechanisms for this aren't I'm not going to go over um, other than some basics. One is to use what's called diazomethane. So diazomethane is CH2N2. If I drew the two Lewis dot structures of diazomethane, they would look like this. So basically, I've taken CH2 and embedded a nitrogen gas molecule in it. Um, there are two resonance structures that look like this. Basically, what can happen is if I take this pair of electrons, give it to the nitrogen, I make nitrogen gas, and I make a CH2 with a lone pair. So diazomethane, if you either heat it carefully or add ultraviolet light, the nitrogen gas will be liberated. You'll make a carbene, that carbene will immediately add to the double bond. So you can make the cyclopropanes that way. That's probably the traditional way of doing it, except that diazomethane, anytime you embed a gas molecule into another molecule, you gotta treat that with a little bit of respect. Because if you all of a sudden make a gas, there's an exothermic nature to that. There's also an expansion so if you had a solid that instantly became a gas, it would expand. And the heat causes the gas to even expand more. So you want to make sure you don't blow yourself up. If you want to make an explosive, embed a gas molecule into another one. That's basic. That's explosion making stuff 101. You know, don't do that unless you're really stupid. And then you'll take care of yourself. But this is how we do that. There are other methods that are a little bit easier. One is to use a Simmons-Smith reagent, which basically means you take diodo, diiodomethane. That's the equivalent of the dichloromethane that we use in labs. And the diodo, diiodomethane reacts with a zinc-copper alloy. And what you end up doing is you end up stabilizing the carbene with zinc, and so it's less explosive. So that's the alternative. Then another reaction that we have to be careful of is that it turns out that halogenated solvents are very unstable with base over long periods, because I'm sure we've probably used base and dichloromethane in the lab, and nothing ever exploded that I know about. Because right. if I did, I'd have to fill out paperwork for it. But if you take something like, this is called um, bromoform, or tribromomethane. If you put that in the presence of potassium hydroxide, what will happen is, is that the hydroxide will remove the carbon 
where we move the hydrogen from the carbon and make this carbanion, which now has a lone pair. There's a negative charge on that. That negative charge on the carbon is actually okay because, the, remember, these bromines are kind of sucking the electron density out of that carbon, so they're helping to stabilize it. But making that carbanion is just the beginning because then what will happen is if I break one of these carbon-bromine bonds, give the pair of electrons to the bromine, I end up with now a dibrominated carbene. And whenever you make carbenes, they just run around solution looking for things to add to. Um, this reaction in particular is pretty bad because that can eventually explode. So we keep halogenated solvents away from bases. We also keep halogenated solvents away from any of the group one metals, like lithium or sodium or potassium. Um, and we'll learn about those, what they do next semester. Um, if you do research with halogenated solvents, you have to dry them. And sometimes people will dry them. Um, we'll dry solvents by adding sodium metal to it. And the sodium metal will react with the trace amounts of water. It's not the spectacular reaction that you may have saw in general chemistry, or you can go on YouTube and see, where they drop sodium metal into water and it explodes. My favorite is they made a little ship out of it, and they ran it down this Hot Wheels track into a kiddie pool of water, and then had it explode. That was pretty creative. If you don't know what Hot Wheels track is, look it up. It's a vintage toy from probably when I was a kid. Um, but the sodium will dry it up, and people will make the mistake of adding sodium to their halogenated solvents and then it explodes. I just remember a graduate student telling me the story of a postdoc doing that in his lab. Or he did it, and then the postdoc's like, what did you just do? And he's like, oh, I'm drying out my dichloromethane with sodium metal. And the postdoc looked at him and just said, oh, it'll explode, and then walked away. I don't know whether it did or not, but I think it scared that student. So again, stereospecificity here. You can take each one of these alkenes and you could react them with these sets of reagents and you can make the cyclopropane molecules. So with these, so with these reagents, I'm going to make a cyclo or I'm going to make a carbene that has the two bromines on it. So that's going to add to the double bond. I'm going to end up forming my triangle with two bromines here. And then looking at my bold and my dashed wedges here, I'm going to preserve the stereochemistry here. So my methyl groups must end up cis, and my hydrogens also must end up cis. So I would make that's one of my two products. You could say, could I reverse and put the methyls on the bold and the hydrogens on the dash? Yes. And actually, that would be the equivalent of adding the carbene from the top or adding the carbene from the bottom. It's going to do a 50-50, so you're going to end up with those two products. So we can do, we can do carbene additions this way. Not a tremendous reaction that's all that useful per se, but it's something that occasionally we like to do. And so this is a way to do it. Okay. So all of the reagents that I showed you here, all these reagents are unique. And they only do one thing, <coughs> they make carbenes. So when you see those, that's what you should think. I'm going to make a cyclopropane with whatever configuration of the double bond, the stereochemistry preserved. OK, hydroxylation. So a few minutes ago, we took, well, we, I took a double bond, made an epoxide out of it, 
and then added H plus H2O to the epoxide, and it opened up. And I added two OHs across the double bond, in essence, in two steps, trans. Made a, the trans dial alcohol, trans dial. Well, here's a way to do it in one step, but you have to do it cis. So if you take a double bond and you add either of these two reagents, the first one is osmium tetroxide, hydrogen peroxide. The second one is KMnO4 with base. And it's critical you remember it's KMnO4 with base because I'm going to show you KMnO4 with not base and it does something completely different. So KMnO4 and base is kind of mild. It's a milder reagent. We'll just kind of remember it that way. Osmium tetroxide, osmium is a, one of the rare earths. It used to be used in TV screens, you know, the type, kind of TV screen that nobody has anymore. It used to be there to make different colors, um, but it's used as a catalyst. So what will happen is I will add two OHs across the double bond, cis. So over here, they should be OH. OH, another OH, and another OH. So I'm making the cis dialcohol. And I'll show you the mechanism just to kind of show you, but the OHs always add cis. So can the reaction be regioselective? No. Because I'm adding two OHs, symmetric reagent. Can it be stereoselective? Yes. I'm adding the two groups 100% cis, so the products, the reaction will be stereoselective if I make a product with two chiral centers. Okay, because I'm doing 100% cis. So then the reaction, why does the reaction go 100% cis? Well, first of all, we know that. I'm going to show you both, but I'm going to start with KMnO4 and base. So if you add KMnO4 and hydroxide, which is base, you're going to end up adding two OHs. So if you're going to memorize that or learn it, you do it enough times, KMnO4 with hydroxide adds two hydroxides. Okay, link those two together. This is oxidation, by the way, because I'm adding two oxygens to my molecule. So this is so this is a hydroxylation. It is oxidation. So if I take my cyclohexene and I react it with KMnO4 and base, I know it's 100% cis because I get two OHs cis. I get no OHs Trans. Okay. Why? Well, here's what happens with the mechanism. The double bond, the pair of electrons with the double bond adds to this oxygen. The manganese oxygen double bond here, the pair of electrons goes into the manganese and then this pair of electrons from the double bond of the oxygen goes to form an O carbon bond. So I end up forming this. Now what's happened is, is that the manganese has gained a pair of electrons in this process. Okay, we normally don't look at oxidation and reduction again this way, but I can look at it like I did in general chemistry. So the manganese gained electrons, that means the manganese, manganese underwent reduction, right? Gain, I remember this as gain electrons reduction. Lose electrons oxidation, right? I do, I do the Leo, the lion goes burr. That's how I remember it. I think there's an oil rig thing, which I've never figured out, and don't care because this works for me. So lose, lose electrons, you're oxidizing, 
oxidizing gain electrons are being reduced. And the critical part here is manganese being reduced, so what's reacting with is being oxidized. So the cis or the product there is oxidized, which fits our easier thing to remember that molecule's gaining oxygen, so it's oxidized. But here's the critical part. The critical part is that if you try and add the two oxygens to the double bond, you don't have enough room to add the oxygen to one side of the double bond and then add the oxygen, the other oxygen to the underside. So this reaction goes through a sort of a five-membered transition state. And this is it. This is all of our geometric shapes. So a triangle is trans, a square is cis, and a pentagon is also cis. Because there's not enough room to add the oxygen to the top and swing the other oxygen underneath. It doesn't work that way. So the potassium permanganate then adds the two oxygens. They must add here cis. And so if they add cis, then what happens is further on in the reaction, the base comes in, strips off the manganese, and these two oxygens be both become OHs. So I'm only showing you the first part of this mechanism to show you that it undergoes a five-member transition state and that the two oxygens add cis. And that's it. So camino 4 hydroxide add two OHs, cis. Now, osmium has a structure that is very similar to camino 4. And so you get a similar movement of electrons here this pair of electrons moving to form the CO bond, this pair of electrons going into the osmium, this pair of electrons going here, so that what I'm missing here are two oxygens, so that I still undergo a five-member transition state to add the osmium then to both of the carbons. So this species is another five-member transition state the two oxygens added cis. Now osmium is potassium permanganate. Permanganate is cheap. I mean, potassium permanganate you used in general chemistry lab, it's purple. And you do use it to do titrations. Um, you might use it in real life if you have an aquarium and it gets cloudy, you add potassium permanganate solution to it. It oxidizes all the carbon stuff and makes it water soluble so it cleans it up. And by the way, it oxidizes, meaning it adds oxygen to those carbon things, which then usually gives you OHs, which makes things water soluble. Oh, look at that chemistry in real life. Doesn't kill the fish as long as you don't use too much of it. But it clears the tank. You add purple stuff, that's what it is. That's your permanent. Dirt cheap. Osmium, not so dirt cheap. So what we do is we use it catalytically, meaning that the hydrogen peroxide that goes with this is probably in like two molar excess of a mole of alkene, but the osmium might be like 10%. So what happens is, is that the hydrogen peroxide comes in here after this guy's been formed. The hydrogen peroxide comes in, it basically removes the osmium and regenerates the OSO4 so it can continue to react. So you only need a little bit of osmium tetroxide and a lot of peroxide, and that'll just continue until all your double bonds used up. And you always do that with anything, with any catalyst that's super expensive, like palladium and platinum, and also with osmium. But in this case, that's the role of the peroxide. Okay. So osmium 
and CAMNO4 add two OHs cis. The last reaction of a double bond is to cleave it. In this case, I change my OH to acid. So now I'm going to use one of two reagents. The first reagent is CAMNO4 and acid. The second reagent is ozone and something else. So these two reagents are actually harsher than CAMNO4 and base. CAMNO4 and base, two OHs, cis. These reagents are actually going to cut the double bond in half. Now notice it says oxidative cleavage. So cleavage means break the double bond. Oxidative means Well, if I cleave the double bonds, what am I going to put in their place? Oxygens. And the kinds of oxygen compounds I'm going to put into place, I'm going to convert that C double bond C into a C double bond O. And so there's different sets of reagents here that we'll have to talk about um, very quickly on Wednesday. And then we'll go from there. So the alkyne reactions, because now we've done it, now we've done it triple bond almost, or double bond almost. The next thing is a triple bond. Triple bonds are boring because they are basically the reaction of a double bond, potentially twice. So for Wednesday, and I haven't released the video, I'll do that when I get back to my office. Again, video, online quiz, and then we'll finish this up on Wednesday, and then on Friday, we'll finish up the triple bonds, and that'll be everything for the semester. Thank you. 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 Thank you.